this is fun. And, you know, it's going to be a small, cozy class of 300, with, of which only three people are present. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be finishing up the uh, Boltzmann machine lecture today and sort of hurry through the subject. But really, uh, what is left is not a whole lot. Now, here's where we stood, right? Which was, we recall what a Hopfield network was. You had this network, which was fully connected. We assumed initially that uh, that all the weights are bidirectional symmetric. I mean, it's not necessary, but this, this assumption makes things a little more convenient to analyze. And uh, the way it worked, anytime you set the network in some specific configuration, each neuron received a field. And if it's the if it uh, uh, the output of the neuron did not match the sign of the field, it flipped. And in so doing, it could change the field elsewhere and make those neurons flip and the whole network could continue to evolve. And so uh, what was guaranteed was that in the process of evolution, this energy term that we defined for the network, which was, you know, if, if your network had five neurons, then your, the fully connected network would look something like this. These, so if I call these bits y1, y2, y3, y4, and y5, then the state of the network was y1 through y5, right? And the energy we defined as y transpose w, y, where w is the weights matrix of the network. And this, we said, kept decreasing every time uh, the network evolved. And so if you initialize the network in some configuration, the network would evolve till the energy hit some local uh, minimum. And so these local minima represent stored patterns. They are con con content addressable memories, also called associative memories. You st initialize the network with a pattern which somewhat resembles this uh, a pattern that is stored and the network will evolve and recall this pattern. It, it's very analogous to biological memory, how our own memory works, uh, which, is, uh, in fact, which is in fact where this model initially uh, came from. Now, so how does this work? There are a couple of different ways of, uh, of uh, using such a memory. So in one, in one situation, you could have uh, something like this, where you, you sort of initialize the entire network with some noisy pattern and let the network evolve. If you let the network evolve, then every bit is going to keep changing until the memory network arrives at a stable state in which, so in that case, you're going to get something like this. You have a, this is the pattern that was stored you give the network this degraded pattern, you let the network evolve, every single bit in the network can evolve. As it flips, all of these bits may keep flipping and eventually all of these bits will settle at some pattern and the pattern that it's going to, it's going to settle in is going to be very similar to the original pattern. The second is pattern completion, where let's say, you know what these, what, let's say you know what these bits are, you just don't know what the remaining bits are. So in that case, you would set these two bits to the, par to the values that you know them to be. You initialize the remaining bits in some manner. And when, you, when the network evolves, only these bits are allowed to flip. These bits are held fixed. And when you do that, you end up with pattern completion. This, if my PowerPoint can stop spinning, you would initialize the network with this incomplete pattern. And when you're done, the entire pattern is going to be recalled. So, yeah. Is it all right? Um, since it's not changing, the, the pattern completion here, um, is this the same Hotfield network that is producing both images on the right? You could be, that's right. So the whole point is that a Hopfield network can, have, can store multiple memories. We saw that, yeah. right? Why, so um, we, why, know. why is that why there is a slight, uh, there's slight mistakes in the reconstruction on the right? 
So there's, that's what we're getting to, right? And uh, so, uh, okay, before we even get to that, right? Okay, uh, yeah. Let's, 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 uh, uh, in fact, they're related. Why do we have these mistakes on the right? So there are two questions over here. The first question is, if I have a, how many patterns can the network store? And we saw that if we had a network with say five neurons, then the number of patterns it could store was going to be sort of about N at best. You could not store more than N patterns. Secondly, uh, these, uh, uh, so which is why we said, if you want to store more than N patterns, then what you can do is to append some bogus bits to every pattern so that now you end up with N plus K bits. And now you can actually store N plus K patterns where you're only interested in the first n bits, you're not interested in the remaining k bits. But because you're storing this extended pattern, uh, you, are, you end up increasing the capacity of the network. Now you can initialize the network in any, in any manner and use all of the same tricks as before. And then when it settles to a pattern, you can just read the first n bits. So this was the business of increasing the capacity, right? The, but the second one is the question that you asked me. Why, when I'm trying to store only these patterns, is the uh, network also uh, giving me noise, right? It doesn't have to, it might even be something completely off. And here is what you, you get. The energy contour of the network typically ends up being not an exact bowl, but only bowls where you know, with, with minima only at the patterns that you're trying to remember, but you also end up with these parasitic minima. And so if you initialize the network at this location, then it's as likely to roll into this pattern. It's in fact going to roll into this parasitic minimum. It's not going to come down to the much deeper valley next to it. And in fact, the parasitic minimum could occur even at this location, which is basically what you saw. It's very similar to the original guy, but you got some noise, right? So question one, if I have a situation of this kind, let's say I initialize something here, or if this network has gone here, the, the, the evolution of the network as we defined it guarantees that it always keeps decreasing the energy of the network, which means once it's stuck over here, it's never going to go back and recall this guy. How can we fix that, right? So is there some mechanism where when it grows into an energy, you give it some way of bumping out of that energy minimum so that it goes to a proper energy minimum and does a better recall? That, uh, so uh, uh, we have that question. And the question, other question of course is, you know, even uh, ignoring this business of noise, how do we, actually make sure that the, uh, the network remembers just the patterns you wanted to remember and nothing else. So uh, for that, let's address the second question first we did in the last class. What we did was we said, I'm going to take the summation of all of the, uh, the energy for all of the patterns that I want to store and I'm going to subtract from it the energy of all of the patterns that I do not want to store. And so that way, uh, what I will be doing is in the energy contour, I will be pulling down the energy of the patterns that I do want to store. And I will be increasing the energy of every other pattern. And if I do so, eventually I expect to get a network that only remembers the patterns that I wanted to remember and doesn't remember the patterns that I don't. Even here, there are limitations. You cannot store more than N patterns in a, in a reliable manner. So, and we saw a couple of ways of doing it. So if I just define the energy this way, right? Then the energy, of course, we saw is defined as uh, summation over target patterns. There's the minus, right? Because you were, uh, you're, uh, uh, if I'm trying to do an main over here, this is, I'm going to be minimizing the energy of the 
patterns. So the energy is minus uh, y transpose wy, y belonging to p. And so plus y belonging to, not belonging to p, y transpose wy. This is an, the energy of my training data, right? And if I take the derivative, that's going to be, uh, if I put in a half here just for convenience sake, this is simply going to be minus uh, y, y transpose summed over the patterns that I want to store. And this is summed over the patterns that I do not want to store y, y transpose. So this, is, this actually ends up being a very simple update rule. And because there's a negative out here, there's a minus out here when you actually uh, use your standard gradient update rule, which is E goes from, I mean, sorry, W goes from W minus eta, the gradient of the loss with respect to W, that's going to be W plus eta, whatever's inside this parenthesis. I mean, that's a little too much math even for what we will be doing. But this little rule assures you that you will, or sort of gives you the chance of learning a network that stores the patterns that you want to remember as minimum energy patterns and uh, increases the energy of all of the remaining patterns. So this was what we did in the last class, right? Then we figured that the second term needs to be summed over too many patterns. So uh, one uh, solution is, so, so we looked at a couple of solutions. One is instead of trying to uh, maximize the energy of all of these guys, we could just focus on the valleys, or in fact, we could just focus on the downstream valleys from the patterns that we are trying to remember, down valley patterns from, from whatever we're trying to remember, or even just initialize the pattern at these points, let it evolve for a couple of steps, and just put these target memories in broad valleys. So this was where we left off in the last class. And of course, there's a second question of how can I get rid of these parasitic memories, right? Now, let's start off by addressing the second question that you asked me first. How can I get rid of these parasitic memories? So if I were to ask you, if I'm, the, you know, I'm here, I want to get some chance of, of some chance of escaping this parasitic memory what do I, what would the appropriate thing to do be? Then if you stopped and thought about it, their answer is going to be when I hit a valley, I don't want to just settle at the valley. I want there to be some mechanism for adding a little bit of noise so that I can add noise to it and let it settle back. And if I add noise and it settles at a different place, then this is probably a small parasitic memory. Whereas if I add noise and it comes right back, then that's probably a good deep memory. So that's kind of a rational way of thinking about it, right? So let's try to actually put that into math. So this making sense to you guys? Yeah, this is simulated annealing, right? It is simulated annealing, right? And so how does simulated annealing work in this situation? For this, we go back to spin glasses. Now, remember, when I talked about spin glasses back two classes ago, I just said that you have all of these dipoles, each dipole is gonna to try to flip and align itself with the field. And uh, in so doing, it's going to try to minimize the total energy of the, of, of the material, but it will change the field elsewhere and those are going to flip and so on. I sort of presented this as a, as a deterministic process. The, the uh, fact of the matter is that magnetic materials, real materials are not deterministic. What happens is that if you have a dipole of this kind, it's in a state. And the state is basically the you know, configuration of all of the, uh, all of the uh, dipoles in the material, right? Now, at any given time, the system is, not, is never stationary. It's never in just one fixed state. What is happening is that when you initialize the network in this material in some state, it begins, uh, it just keeps flipping. It keeps changing state all the time. And the, and if the energy of the material is at a higher temperature, 
it changes state more rapidly. If it's at a lower temperature, it does a little less of changing state. And what we are actually characterizing is the probability that this material is going to be in any particular state. Now, what happens if I stake some material, dielectric or otherwise, and heat it, right? This is simulated annealing. What will happen is that it's going to, the states are going to keep randomly flipping between various possibilities. Then as the material cools, the number of states that it will flip between keeps decreasing as the network cools, the effective number of states, the number of choices in state keeps decreasing. And the only time the material never ever changes state anymore is when the material is at absolute zero, minus 273 centigrade or zero Kelvin. And you know the universe never really reaches zero, zero degree Kelvin, right? So uh, this is actually, although I talked about it as a deterministic process, this is actually stochastic. And so how does the system behave? So let's say I have a dielectric with just five, four dipoles. So I have Y1 through Y4. I'm speaking of a dielectric material over here, okay? Then there are 16 possible states, right? Zero, 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 all the way through one, 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 one. Corresponding to each of these states is a potential energy of the material. So let me call this E of S, okay? And the system is going to keep randomly flipping between the states. And so the expected, the average potential energy of the system is going to be summation, the probability of the state times the energy of the state. This is the potential energy of the system. Now, this is the capacity of the network of the system to do work, right? But the capacity of the system to do work is kind of countered by the init uh, disorder in the system. And the disorder in the system is going to be dependent on the entropy of the system. And the entropy of the system is simply going to be, you know, KT, this is the Boltzmann constant, this is the temperature. And the entropy of the system is simply given as uh, PS log PS. Right, we are, you're all familiar with the entropy of the system. And so uh, this is a minus. So it's just the, the total energy is the entropy plus the potential energy. And what the system is going to do is at any temperature. So let's say you took the material and set it at 100 degrees centigrade. Even at 100 degrees centigrade, the system is going to evolve. Initially, it's gonna keep flipping between the various states and then the probability with which it visits the various states sort of settles to some equilibrium. What is the equilibrium? It, the equilibrium is going to be the value where this Helmholtz free energy is minimized. Basically, it's trying to minimize the combination of the potential energy and the disorder that the temperature actually introduced. And which is why, you know, when T is anything other than zero. So this energy was what we saw for the Hopfield network, right? This is what we spoke of. The reality is that you have this disorder introduced by, by heat. And it's this total term that the system is going to try to minimize. So at any given temperature, you would be minimizing the Helmholtz free energy. If you actually worked out the arithmetic for this, and found out what is the probability distribution over the states such that this guy is minimized, they're gonna end up with this distribution over here, which says that the probability of any state is a normalizing constant times E raised to minus of the potential energy of the state divided by KT. So basically when you take this, this, this spin glass and leave it, hold it at some temperature, then it's gonna evolve until the probability of visiting any state becomes this term over here. That's when it's an equilibrium. And even when it's at equilibrium, it's never going to be in any one state. It is going to keep flipping between the states. 
and the states are visited with this probability, right? And so the evolution of the system is actually stochastic. At equilibrium, the system visits various states according to the Boltzmann distribution. This is the so-called Boltzmann distribution, named after the, after the Boltzmann constant. And the probability that it visits any state is inversely related, not inversely proportional, but proportional to the exponent raised to the negative of the energy. The probability is inversely related to its energy. The greater the energy, the less likely that state is going to be visited. And the most likely state is the lowest energy state. Okay. So is this making sense to you guys? What are you? Yes. Right. So this is very easy. There's nothing fancy. We're going to stick that into our Hopfield networks. Instead of making it a deterministic process that just rolls down the hill, we're going to add a little bit of noise during the evolution so that it can escape from these little bumps. And the way we will do it, we're going to say that instead of, uh, if it's in any particular state, then earlier, the way we defined it earlier, we said that if, you, if you're in some state S, then you can go from state S to state S prime only if the energy of S prime was less than energy of S. This was the, uh, uh, or we rather showed that if we use the standard evolution uh, mechanism, this property was guaranteed, right? Instead, we're going to change, make the evolution mechanism somewhat different. We're going to say that the probability that it will actually go to any state. So uh, let's say you are in some state S. Then flipping a bit takes it to the state S prime. Then what is the probability that it will actually go to S prime? In the earlier definition, if the flipping the bit increased the energy, you never went to the state. Instead, we're going to say we will, we will permit visiting the state under some condition. What is the condition? The probability of being able to go to a state S prime is going to be proportional to E raised to the negative of the energy of the state for S prime, okay? So we made it stochastic. And so the probability is gonna be E raised to minus E S divided by this normalization term. Now, how does this work out mathematically? Mathematically, here's what I've got, right? I have, let's say I have this network and I'm just going to draw a four unit network. Then let's say this is one that's currently in this pattern. This is my S. And then if I look at S prime, let's say the only thing that changed was this one bit, right, this one bit. Now, what is the energy of uh, this pattern? The energy of this pattern, and let's, let red be one and green be say minus one, right, for, for now, okay. So the energy of this pattern is going to be the contribution of these edges, which do not involve this guy, plus, so I'll call this E of, you know, not bit, plus one times, because this is one, this, and let me call this the neuron I, summation WJI, state i. I'm calling the outputs of these individual bits the state at this point, right? And there's a minus. Is it a minus? There's going to be a minus, right? There's a minus. Now, for this guy, again, I have the contribution of these three guys, right? Which is E not bit. But now, so minus and minus becomes plus, plus one, times is W J I S I. So if I take the log of P of S, 
minus log of p of s prime. This is s, this is s prime. This, if I take the subtract, that's going to be simply e of s minus or minus of e of s plus e of s prime because the probability is proportional to e raised to the energy, right? Which is going to be, if I work this out, just keeping track of this, this, this guy here is going to be e of not bit minus plus summation wji s s i that's from this first term which is this guy and then i'm going to be subtracting this next one which is plus this is going to be plus e of not bit this one plus summation wji s i right these will cancel and the only term that I'm going to be left with is this WGI SI, which are the terms, which is basically the field at this neuron times one. There's a factor of half, which I'm being sloppy about. So the log of P of S minus log of P of S prime, if you work it out, it's simply going to be summation. If, if, if I define the energy with a half, that's simply going to be uh, one times the field at that uh, field at that uh, at, the, at that neuron. Okay, but then what is log of p of s minus log of p of s prime? That is simply going to be p of s log of p of s divided by p of s prime, and this p of s prime is very the only difference between s and s prime is going to be that one bit, right? So the probability of this pattern where only this one bit has changed, all I have to do is for this one bit, I have to change the probability to the probability of minus one, which is one minus the probability of one, okay? So is this thing making sense to you guys, this little equation here? Anyone? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, I'm just a little confused where the log p minus log p s s prime came from. So I've just randomly written right. Yeah. I'm, I've just randomly written it. That's it, right? Okay, because it looks okay. like the change in entity without the p of s in front. So so basically, if I if I take the log of p of s, what is the log? So here's what I'm saying. Suppose I'm in this pattern, and I'm considering evolving to this other guy. Okay, mm -hmm. then. This log of PFS, what is the probability of being in this pattern? What is the log ratio of the probability of being in this pattern and the probability of being in this pattern? It's, it's log oh, of yeah. PFS divided by PFS prime, right? And, that, and so that simply becomes this, this, this difference. And if you work it out, basically because the contribution of all of the other neurons disappears, you just become end up with the log of the probability of this one neuron given the rest of the pattern divided by the probability of this other value for the same neuron given the rest of the pattern. And so the probability of one divided by the probability of minus one is the probability of one divided by one minus the probability of one, right? So this is all that remains. And that we saw is simply this field. So if you work through the arithmetic, you say log of P of SI equals one divided by one minus P of SI equals one, it's just the field. And then you solve for P of SI equals one, given the rest of the pattern. Uh, and if you just step through the arithmetic, you end up with this little formula here, which says that the probability that SI takes the value one is simply one over one plus E raised to the negative of the field at that neuron. Is this term looking familiar to you guys? This one? Yes. Right. That's your standard logistic, right? Yes. So this, so all that ugly math descends to something very interesting, very simple. When I re redefine my Hopfield network as a stochastic system, each neuron is now a stochastic unit with a binary state SI. 
which can take a value instead of minus one and one, I'm going to use the value zero and one just because it's more convenient. So in terms of writing things, if this can take the value either zero or one, which with, a, with, with the probability that depends only on the local field and specifically, it's like saying that I'm going to set a neuron to one, the, uh, deciding whether you're going to set the neuron value to one is like drawing from this little logistic distribution, which logistic probability, right? And so if I choose this rule for evolution, this Hopfield network becomes a probability distribution over binary sequences. And the distribution itself that it models is the Boltzmann distribution. And the conditional distribution of individual bits in the sequence is going to be a logistic. So, so here's how we're going to do this. Now, if I want to convert this, this, this Boltzmann machine, this Hopfield network to a, uh, a, a stochastic version so that it can escape these little dips, here's what I will do. Uh, I'm going to initialize all of the neurons. Then I cycle through the neurons. At each neuron, I compute the field. Then I compute the logistic, this logistic function at the field. And I randomly flip a coin with this probability of heads. And we all know how to do that, right? And if that random coin ends up with a heads, I'm going to set that neuron to one. Otherwise, I'm going to set it to zero, OK? And then I'm going to move to the next neuron and repeat the same process. And then the next neuron and repeat the same process. I'm going to keep cycling through the neurons at each point. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm going to initialize all of the neurons, right? And then I'm going to cycle through the neurons. And at each for each neuron, I'm going to compute the field. I'm going to compute the logistic for the field. And I'm going to choose the new value for that neuron by drawing stochastically from this logistic. That's it. And when do we stop? So now, now this, is a, this is a random process, correct? It's going to keep on evolving. Because at any point, you have the probability, you, are, you have a probability that you can actually uh, flip the neuron. So when do we stop? And what, what is the final state of the system? How do we recall a memory? These are the two questions you end up with. So is this making sense to you guys? Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so this is this is very simple, right? We didn't make a tremendous change to the basic Hopfield network. So let's look at how we define the final state of the system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let the system evolve. I'm going to set it, and then I'm going to keep iterating using this little process. After it has iterated for a long enough time, I'm going to take a snapshot of the final, you know, L. Or find of you know it's it's evolved for a long time. I'm going to take snapshot. Take a snapshot of the final few uh, states, and at each state, I'm just going to take the average of those states. And depending on whether it's major each whether each bit is majority one or majority minus one in that little window, I'm going to set it to set it to either one or zero, depending on whether you're using the one one minus one or one zero notation. So uh, this, this process itself is very simple, right? This is the, uh, and so noisy pattern completion, initialize the entire network and let the entire network evolve using this behavior. And if I'm doing pattern completion, I'm going to fix the seen bits and learn only let the unseen bits evolve using the same logic, right? So then I can sort of, up it a little bit. Now, this whole thing is, now it's become completely stochastic, right? When I do this, it's just, it's just random. The Hopfield network is fully deterministic. So it turns out you can add a control term, which slides, lets it slide between being fully stochastic and fully deterministic by adding this one minus T temperature term at the beginning. When the temperature is one, it's basically uh, the, the, uh, the logistic that I just showed. If the temperature is infinite, then these Zs are all going to be zero, which means that this, this thing is going to just behave randomly. It's not going to remember any pattern. If the temperature is zero, then basically this becomes a very deterministic Hopfield network. It's just 
the a small difference in energies is going to get hugely magnified. And so it's always going to go towards a lower energy uh, state. So this is uh, in the standard evolution of the system, you often start with a high temperature and slowly temp lower the temperature towards to a temperature towards zero. Uh, you'd still be using the Z right, in the uh, evolution structure and you'd let it, let it evolve. So uh, this field quantifies the energy difference by flipping the current unit. If the difference is not large, then the probability of flipping remains zero, right? Uh, as it approaches 0.5. So if I've got, uh, which means is that if the field, the field is zero, then sigma zero is going to be 0 0.5. It's the logistic, right? And so if I make the temperature very large, then z is going to become zero. So sigma of zero is 0.5. So at high temperatures, every bit keeps randomly flipping. At t equals one, you just got the behavior we discussed a few minutes ago. At t equals zero, it becomes a deterministic hot field. And so the annealed version of it, simulated annealing, is basically what we just saw, where you start off at, high, at a high temperature and sort of slowly bring the temperature down. And that is much more likely to a good, do a good job of recalling the patterns that you wanted to remember. So are we good so far, guys? I'm rushing through, but. Yes. Yeah, OK. So now the question is, when do we stop, right? This, the probability of each neuron is a conditional distribution, right? So it's the probability, if, if I'm thinking of just flipping, looking at the probability distribution of just this neuron, I'm asking what is the probability of this neuron taking the value one given the rest of the uh, network. The overall probability is simply going to be multiplying this over all of the neurons, right? So, so the overall probability is going to be given by for any state, it's given by this term over here. Then this is the energy. So this is the probability of the state. And uh, you're going to sort of stop evolving when the overall log probability of the patterns stops increasing. So it turns out that this process of evolution is a likelihood Increase is, is, is a process of increasing the likelihood of the patterns that the network arrives at. So uh, the point of that is that basically what this means is that you can think of this Hopfield network as a distribution. If I started at any pattern and just keep letting it evolve, and I begin taking samples of these of the of the, of the bit, bit patterns after after some time those samples are going to be samples from this distribution, which is the Boltzmann distribution. And so the Bowles, this Hopfield network is actually a generator for samples from the Boltzmann distribution. That's why you call it a Boltzmann machine, okay? Now, so this is just sort of connecting just the Hopfield network to the Boltzmann machine. But then uh, the whole point again is, you know, content addressable memory. You want to be able to recall certain patterns and you want to be able to do them well. And this stochastic behavior is meant to escape uh, noise, minimum, uh, so the uh, uh, local minima induced by noise. Now, how do you train the network? If I'm training the network, once I begin, rea once I realize that this is a, uh, actually representing a probability distribution. Then I want to train the network such that the probability of the patterns that I want to remember is maximized. Now, this, the, there's a nice little caveat that comes out of this. If I'm maximizing the probability of the patterns I want to remember, the only way I can do this is by minimizing the probability of all the other patterns that I do not want to remember because the probabilities must sum to one. So this little criterion, this maximum likelihood criterion automatically encapsulates the condition that we set out when we were talking about training the Hopfield network, remember? So that is what we're going to do. And the probability of any state is e raised to 
minus of the energy of the state divided by this normalization constant term, which is the sum over all states of e raised to minus energy of the state. So this guy, so if I'm trying to train this network and I've got a bunch of patterns I want to remember, these are my training inputs, where you're allowed to repeat some patterns. So these don't have to be just the patterns by themselves. You can think of it as, as sampling the patterns that you wanted to remember from real life. So some patterns may occur more frequently than others. Patterns may be repeated. You, you know, you're just repeatedly presenting these patterns for the network to remember. So this one is supposed to assign higher probability to patterns that you see more frequently and lower probability to patterns that are not part of the training data, right? So it's maximum likelihood of the stored states. Now, if I work out the arithmetic, I won't go through worry with the arithmetic. What happens is if I take the log likelihood of any pattern, that is simply going to be minus of this, the energy for the pattern minus the log of the summation term below. So uh, the, which is simply the, this guy here, this is the weighted sum of all of the pairs of bits for the target pattern minus the log of this normalization constant, which of course sums over all patterns. And since you're going to be maximizing the log probability of all of your training data, the actual log likelihood you would be maximizing is going to be the average of the log likelihood of all of your all of the patterns you're trying to remember. And so that's going to be the average of this guy over here over all of your training data. And if you work through the arithmetic, so, so if you use standard gradient ascent in this case to maximize this likelihood, you'd be taking the derivative and the derivative for this, so, the de so, so this is the term that you're trying to maximize. The derivative of this first term with respect to any wij, if you look at it, it's simply going to be sisj, right? Out here. And so it turns out that the derivative with respect to any weight has two terms. The first term is the average of the product of the two bits at the end of that weight. So for example, if I'm trying to learn this weight, the weight for this connection, then it's going to be, the derivative is going to be the average of the product of these two bits across all of my training data minus a second term. And what is the second term? The second term is the derivative of this normalization constant. Again, I won't work through the arithmetic, but if you will, but at the end of it all, what you're going to get is the expected. So the first term is the product of these two guys for all of the training patterns. The second term is the product of these two guys, the, uh, the expected value of the product of these two guys over all possible patterns including all the patterns that you do not want to store. So basically, this ends up looking a lot like Hebbian learning. In Hebbian learning, all we did was we did summation SI, SJ, one over N. Now we are going to do where, where is this? So in Hebbian learning, all we did was the, the uh, derivative with respect to W, we saw was one over N. These were all the patterns that you were trying to store. You had SI, SG, right? Now you're going to have a second term, which is the one over N prime, which is the total number of patterns. This is the complete set of patterns, SI, SG. Is this making sense, guys? Yeah. And this looks a lot like what we saw for, what we saw for uh, the half field network, where we said we want to raise the energy of all of the patterns that we don't like, right? 
so yeah. this is so this is the expected value of those products for those patterns and how exactly do you compute the expected value if you go then obviously summing over all patterns is not possible you can say i'm going to take a i'm going to draw samples from the distribution if i want to get mathy i can say i'm going to draw samples from the distribution but the reality of it is what you're really going to do is to initialize the network somehow let it run for a bit and then take a snapshot and so you can take many such snapshots these are what we will call simulations and from those snapshots you can compute this average value this again looks a lot like what we spoke about when we spoke about you know the update rule for the hopfield network in the last class and so uh we end up with this very simple update rule which is looks a lot like the the uh update rule that we had for hopfield networks this each weight is going to be updated by by as weight plus some eta times this derivative but this derivative is simply the average of the product of the bits for the patterns you're trying to store minus the average of the product of the bits when you just let the network run several times and basically in what we call simulation mode so this is basically exactly what we saw before and so now we can just use this update rule to learn the weights of the network you initialize the weights let the network run to get several times to get a bunch of simulated state samples compute the gradient update the weights repeat the process right which is basically the same as doing what we did earlier except again instead of increasing the weights everywhere we said we can just sort of sample it at a few times by letting it run a few times right that's basically what this is so as it turns out the boltzmann machine is just a fancy hopfield network the only difference was that by adding a little bit of stochasticity by saying that i'm going to flip a bit earlier we were saying that i would only flip a bit if flipping the bit decreases the overall energy in the network now we are saying that i'm going to flip a bit but the probability of flipping a bit is going to depend on the energy and the change in the energy and if the change in the energy is you know negative it's going to be much more likely that i will flip the bit than if than if it's positive which gives you the ability to escape little minimum okay so we sort of set that particular ghost of this very fancy sounding boltzmann machine to rest it's basically a fancified hopi network but then uh uh let's think of see how we can add capacity to the hopi network let's go back to what we the last thing we discussed the network by itself can store up to n patterns if i want to store n plus k patterns then what i'm going to do is add a large number of neurons whose actual values i don't care about so this is where the actual power of the stochastic nature of the boltzmann machine comes in it's when you add these extra bits and why is that right if i was thinking of this as a hopfield net then if i just added these if i if i had these four bits and to increase the capacity of the network let's say i added these eight bits right so instead of having four patterns that i could store now i've gone to 12 patterns that i could store then let's say the pattern i was originally trying to store was 1010 what must these bits be to enhance my ability to recall 1010 10. there's no clear answer to this when you think about it purely in terms of the hopfield network when you think of it in terms of the boltzmann machine you end up with an answer you want to set these guys you don't want to merely set these guys to a fixed value you want to say i want to compute the i want to 
uh, ideally what I would want to do is uh, I want to run the network many times and average out what happened over here and focus on what focus on these four, four bits. So you want to be able to marginalize these unnecessary bits. So in another way of thinking about it is that uh, you can say that I'm, exp I'm expanding this guy in many different ways, basically in every possible way. And when I let the network revolve, so let's say uh, I'm trying to do some pattern completion. So I don't know this one pattern. I fix these guys. I let the network evolve many times. And over all of these, I'm going to be averaging, I'm going to be finding the average value for this bit here. But in each of the runs, I actually allow this set of useless bits to take different values. So uh, it allows you some extra flexibility in the process. Let's see how we can do this, right? Uh, so these neurons now are what we will call the visible neurons, the ones that you're interested in. The ones you're not interested in, we'll call them the hidden neurons. This can be set to anything in order to store a visible pattern. And for a given set of visible neurons, there are any number of hidden patterns that you can expand them by. Which ones do we choose? We're going to choose the patterns over here that minima maximize the probability of the visible neurons, right? So we're going to be choosing the patterns over here that such that the, uh, the uh, energy contribution of these visible neurons is minimized. Now, to find those patterns, you'd have to search over all possible patterns. We don't actually do that. Uh, we, what, we are going to what we are going to do is to think of this in a kind of statistical way. The, uh, uh, we are going to basically ignore what happens here. How do I do this? So think of a Boltzmann machine, which has all of these bits. These are the visible bits. These are the useless bits. I'm going to call them the hidden bits, OK? Then if I set this to, say, 1010, one, then if I thought of the Boltzmann machine as a uh, as a stochastic machine, every time I run it, if I fix these guys and just let these guys evolve, every time I run it, I'm going to get a different pattern for these hidden bits. And so what I can think of is say, I'm going to run this many times and I'm going to consider all of these as my training data. And the patterns which are more likely will appear, appear more frequently. And the patterns which are less likely are going to appear less frequently. And I'm going to train this network such that the overall probability of the total probability of all of these patterns where the first four bits are fixed at 1010 is maximized. So uh, it's a now. Again, that's mathematical gobbledygook. If I think of this in terms of practical implementation, what we want, it becomes much simple. We are interested in the marginal probabilities over the visible bits. We want to learn to represent these guys. These guys, we don't really care about. They are so what we will call the latent bits. But what the network actually remembers is the complete pattern, the union of the visible bits and the hidden bits. So we want to train the network to maximize the probability of the visible bits. And, and so you want to tr train the uh, network to assign, moreover, you know, we are, we are only presenting the visible bits to the network to remember, right? So you want the network to train the network to assign 
whatever desired probability distribution you have, which is the bits that have been presented more frequently should be remembered more. The bits that have been presented less frequently, the patterns that have been presented less frequently should be remembered less. The patterns that have never been presented should have very low or zero probability, right? So this is what we want to actually achieve. And the probability for the visible bits, of course, sums over all of the hidden bits of the, it sums the joint probability of the visible and hidden bits over all of the hidden bits. Now, if you work through the arithmetic again and try to perform maximum likelihood training, what ends up happening is something very interesting. The math sort of works out very simply. It's on the slides, so I won't go through it. But for each training pattern, what I can do is just fix the visible units and let the hidden neurons, neurons evolve. It's going to give me, basically it comes back to this. I'm gonna fix this guy. I'm going to let these guys evolve. I'll get a completed pattern. And I'm going to end up with many such completions of this, these fixed patterns. And I'm going to treat all of these guys, all of these completions as the patterns that I'm trying to remember. Then, uh, so, but remember the actual uh, update rule was the average of the product, product of the bits that you're trying to remember minus uh, product of the bits over the patterns that you're trying to remember minus the average of the product of the bits over all of the patterns, right? So the only thing that changed when you added these extra bits was that now each pattern is not just one pattern. You're going to complete it many times by letting this portion evolve. And so you're going to get these extended patterns, many clones of each training pattern by where many copies, where the only difference is in the hidden, hidden bits. And you're going to treat this expanded set as the set of patterns that you're trying to remember. And the second one, this is going to be exactly the same as before. We are using the same approach that we did earlier, where you simply initialize the network, let it evolve for a bit, and uh, do this several times. And then you find the patterns and you compute the product of the bits. And this difference between these two averages is the derivative that you use to update the bits. So uh, the overall training paradigm for the Boltzmann machine ends up being very simple. That's basically the same thing that we saw for the Hopfield network, except that the patterns we want to remember are visible bit patterns. We're gonna complete them many times by letting the network evolve. This first term is gonna be over the completed patterns. And the second term is over the simulations, the, 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 the random samples. So uh, this is your very simple Boltzmann machine. It's an extension of the Hopfield network. It enables, and because you have this extension, uh, it enables storage of many more patterns than Hopfield networks. Uh, it also enables computation of probabilities of patterns, and, but bec and because it has a stochastic aspect to it, it tends to be, uh, it, it has the ability to escape local minima and do a cleaner job of recalling patterns than the standard Hopfield network, right? So here is the overall training paradigm. You're given a set of training patterns you we want the network to remember, uh, which could be repeated to represent relative importance or probabilities of patterns. You initialize the weights. You run simulations. First, you clamp these bits. These are because these are the training bits, right? And then you run the network several times. And so you get these expanded versions of the training samples. That's a clamped training. Then you let the entire network evolve, including these guys. Those are that's unclamped training, and you're going to get unclamped training samples. You use those to compute this gradient you update your network and you iterate, very simple, right? And 
Now, once you have trained the network, you can do all the other things, same as before. If you want to have pattern completion, let's say I have this, somebody has given me an incomplete pattern where I know only these three bits. Then I'm going to fix these three bits. I'm going to let the entire network evolve several times. Then I read these two bits. I read these, I run it several, I, I run the entire process many times. And then I take the average of all the recovered, uh, uh, all the read off values for these two missing bits and fill, the, fill in the holes in the patterns by the uh, recovered bits. So these things over here, basically, if I were doing or using this, doing this using a Boltzmann machine, in one case, if I were just simply trying to uh, denoise, I would initialize all of these bits and then let the network run several times and then sample those bits and take the averages. And I would actually get a reconstruction of this kind. With the Boltzmann machine version, I expect the reconstruction to be much cleaner, something like this. If I'm doing pattern completion, then I'm going to fix the bits that I already have, let the network evolve several times, and then read off the bits that I do not have and let those to fill up, right? So guys, have I lost you completely? Yes, no. no. No, this is pretty cool. Right. So, I mean, I'm skipping a lot of the math because the math is kind of irrelevant, right? Uh, when you get onto how the whole thing works, it's very simple. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Now I can actually use Boltzmann machines for classification. Suppose I've got features and a class, right? Then what happens is your features are going to take, I can write the features out in binary. I can have the features F1, F2, F3, F4, F4. Then I can have the class also written in binary, C1, C2, C3, right? And for the same class, I'm going to get many training instances. What I, I will just think of all of these as my patterns for the network to remember. And this will be some n bit. This is good. This entire thing is going to be n bits. I augment it by some k bits. I can think of the entire this this thing and these things. These my training data as patterns to remember. Classification can be thought of as pattern completion. During classification, I just get the feature values, right? So I fix the feature values. I let the network evolve, and then I can read off the class bits. So. Although this is a content addressable memory, memory is the same as classification when you think of it that way. You can just augment your, you can append your features and your class. You get these augmented features, these extended patterns. You remember those, you treat classification as uh, pattern classification. It's really simple, right? Uh, there's just a little bit, why don't we use Boltzmann machines, right? No, but, and so now, this can be used for all sorts of things. I give it, I, I, I train, I learn images. I should be able to fill out the holes in images. I give, uh, I train, I learn and train and clean data. I should be able to denoise data. Uh, I can use it for classification. It's a very versatile and very powerful machine. So why don't we use it? Turns out training takes forever, right? Uh, because the number of bits you have to add to make the whole thing work can be very large. And then observe that over here for every single step of training, I'm running a whole bunch of simulations and that ends up becoming super expensive. So you can't really do it. So what we actually use are what are called, what are called restricted Boltzmann machines. Now, when I showed you the standard Boltzmann machine over here, I treated this extended pattern as one large pattern. So if I were ha if I uh, had something of this kind, so let's say I had a three bit pattern that I was trying to remember and I augmented it using say two bits. So this was N and this was K. My network would have been something of this kind where all five bits connect to the remaining 
four bits, right? All five bits connect, connect to the remaining four bits. This causes problems. So what we do in the restricted Boltzmann machine is very interesting. I still have these five bits. It's going to be like so. But then I will only add connections from the hidden bits to the visible bits. Something like this, okay? Do you see the difference between these two guys? Yes. The visible bits don't connect to one another. The hidden bits do not connect to one another. Okay. So I can draw the network like so, where I have the hidden bits and I have the visible bits the visible bits connect to all the hidden bits, the hidden bits connect to all the visible bits, but they don't communicate with one another. This was originally called the harmonium model, model by Paul Smolensky. And the rest of the, uh, the, the, the uh, dynamics remain the same, right? You're gonna flip each neuron based on the, on the logistic computer at the incoming field, but now, this modified structure adds a huge benefit, right? The hidden, the hidden bits are only going to respond to a field computed from the visible bits. The visible bits are only going to compute a respond on to a field be, uh, derived from the hidden bits. And so, uh, you know, because we don't have these interconnections, things become much simpler here when you had full connections, changing this bit, changing one hidden bit could have influenced, one visible bit could have changed another visible bit. Changing that visible bit could have changed, influenced another visible bit. There was a direct influence. You had these loops, those loops go away, right? So, uh, which means that even, you know, when I, when, I, when I got a visible bit and uh, I visible bit pattern, and then I wanted to complete it, there were many ways of completing this visible bit pattern because fixing these guys, they influenced one another, right? If you looked at these hidden bits, these hidden bits influenced each other so they could keep, that there were many ways of completing this guy. But then if I think of separating the two, these guys are anchored. Once these guys are anchored, there's only one flip possible for these guys. Flipping this hidden bit, if I fix the visible bits, flipping one hidden bit has no influence directly on another visible bit, hidden bit because they are not interconnected. And this kind of uh, greatly simplifies the whole process. What we're gonna do is now, uh, here's, here's what we will do. If I'm trying to train the network, I'm gonna fix the hidden bits. Then based on these hidden bits, I only have to sample these guys once. And I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna get the completed pattern for that, for, for the pattern that I'm trying to remember. So uh, let's skip this slide. Here's what happens. I'm going to fix this hidden bit, fix the visible bit. And then I'm going to sample once, just once, and I get the corresponding hidden bit values. That's it. Subsequently, I, if I can allow the visible bits to also change, this actually ends up being part of the random sampling. This is the only portion that remains, that is the completion. The rest of it just becomes part of the random sampling. And so, uh, what you would do in a restricted Boltzmann machine is that you'd fix the hidden bits, sample the vi fix the visible bits, sample the hidden bits. That's going to give you the first portion, the the, the first first component of your uh, gradient update rule. Then you let the hidden bits influence the visible bits, which influence the hidden bits, which influence the visible bits, which influence the hidden bits, and so on. And eventually, you're going to get some 
some pattern here. And the second term is going to be read off only what happened at the end. But then it, it makes some, you can, you can simplify things even further, right? Remember when we spoke of Hopfield nets, we said if, if you, when you start at some bit, there's no need to go all the way to the valley. In fact, that could be dangerous. You just want to let the network evolve for just a few steps and then pull up the location that you were at. So that applies even here. And this is what they call contrastive divergence. And fix the hidden bit, sample the, fix the visible bits, sample the hidden bit, and then let the network evolve for only two steps. And so this first term is going to be computed from this pair. And the second term is going to be computed from this pair. And you get your update row. And this is highly, highly, highly efficient. This actually works, right? As opposed to this fully connected Boltzmann machine, the restricted Boltzmann machine with contrastive divergence, which just requires this little bit of sampling for each training instance, can give you highly efficient training. And it's sufficient to give you a good estimate of the gradient. So uh, I managed to get almost to the end. So these restricted Boltzmann machines are the favored kind of Boltzmann machines. They're excellent, excellent generative models for binary or binarized data. They can be extended to continue, continuous valued data. They can be used for classification as we saw. They can be used for regression. And it turned out that the most common use, the, they, they, I mean, these really became popular when, uh, when uh, Hinton figured out how to use these to pre-train models to initialize neural networks for proper training. And that, in fact, is one of the biggest uses for uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. Also, we've been talking about everything in terms of uh, uh, binary valued activations. Those activations don't have to be binary. You can actually make these activations continuous valued uh, and or you can uh, so where now you can say that the probability for any bit over here is not just a simple sigmoid. A visible bit is not merely a sigmoid. The probability for the visible bit can you can you can factor in something like a Gaussian with, the, with means and variances, and the whole math still works. We won't go through. And there are other variants where you can have things like these, where uh, you factor the hidden units into many subsets. So now the visible units are directly connected to only the first set of hidden units, which are connected to the second set, which are connected to the third set. This increases the capacity of the network, but it also sort of simplifies the computation even further because you're reducing the interconnections between these neurons. And this is what they called a deep Boltzmann machine. And if you make the uh, connections by instead of being bidirectional, uh, symmetric, if you make the connections non-symmetric, you end up with something called a Helmholtz machine. But all of these are simple extensions of the basic Boltzmann machine that we just saw. And so uh, I've come to the end of this series of lectures. I've missed a bunch of topics. I sort of rushed through Boltzmann machines because uh, uh, basically out of time, right? Uh, so we haven't uh, looked at things like other algorithms besides what we just saw for learning and inference. We haven't seen mean field approximations. We haven't seen how RBMs can be used as feature extractors or for pre-training. We know they can be used as generative models, but we haven't actually seen, gone into that in too much detail. And we haven't seen more structured uh, deep Boltzmann machines. But what you've seen in the lecture so far should give you a fairly strong intuition for how the whole thing works. And the key here is to not get bogged down with the mathematics of it, but to think, look at it from the mechanics of it, uh, which actually often gives you a better idea of what's really going on than if you begin, if you get bogged down with the math. So I'll stop here. Any questions, guys? So the, the, limited the, the restricted Boltzmann machine is getting rid of the interdependencies of within the layers that's it within those layers yeah so they don't affect each other they only affect the hidden and yeah yeah they only affect the other exactly 
Yeah, okay. And that simplifies things a whole lot, right? And yeah. you can factor it even further. Even the hidden guys could be uh, organized in cliques. Oh and yeah, this, that, this is just this is just getting rid of one of the connections or something. Right. This is yeah, getting rid of some of the connections, right? Yeah. And then yeah, okay. Right. And so this this actually ends up becoming you'll have to work out the, 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 the algorithms to train it a little more carefully, but this is actually going to be more efficient than just having putting all of these in one giant ball, right? And because the and because there's the same number of neurons, the information isn't lost. It's just the possibilities of of dependencies and changes is exactly. Is exactly. Oh cool. Cool, cool, cool. So it can still store store the same number. Yeah, and so, but the thing that the, 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 the thing to think about is that it, you can think about it in terms of uh, distributions now, right? So, because you're thinking about it in terms of distributions, uh, you can think about it as, uh, for example, if I uh, train this network where I give it lots and lots of images, for instance, out here, and I train the entire network to remember a whole bunch of images, then if the thing is structured properly, if you generate random stuff and you look at what has been generated out here, it's more likely to be a valid image than not. So it actually ends up being a nice generative model as well. So you get these other benefits.